with genocide before around Sudan, um, and it's just starting to work with coal. Um, and to kind of start a dialogue about endowment, as you can see, um, there's been a bunch of issues around the endowment, around transparency, around tuition, around a lot of things. So, um, so I think that this is an effective way to start that dialogue and really continue it. Uh, so we have three out of four panelists tonight, but uh, before that, I just want to get some introductions from the co-sponsors, letting, letting everybody here know why they decided to support this event. Uh, first up is Campus Live with Joseph. Mm -hmm. Do you just come up? Sure. Stand chapter. 
interacted across the country that would be with Sudan, that best Africa. Um, and then after that, ran its course and kind of switched to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, which is one of our other main conflicts. Uh, and that, in that capacity, we're involved in the Conflict Free Campus Initiative, uh, which is sort of a mix of responsible investing and investment, uh, uh, investing in mines that are not violent, that are not funding uh, rebel militias, and divesting from those that are funding rebel militias. Um, and a host of other issues, uh, UN treaties, things like that. Uh, but those are the kind of ways we're involved in the rest of it. Uh, so we're totally behind the on poll. Uh, I'm glad y'all are, are coming out to the event. Um, and then finally, our last sponsor, Beyond Coal, uh, Robert Courier, will come up and talk a little bit about our investment campaign um, and maybe a little bit about what the endowment is. <laughs> Thanks again for coming. My name is Robert Coyer, and uh, this event kind of started as an idea being tossed around between me and Tate in December because we feel like um, a lot of these issues that we're dealing with with the coal industry are not really new. Um, for a long time throughout the history of mankind, people have been marginalized for profit, and, and that's what the coal industry is doing. And we're trying to get um, the broader campus community to talk about coal the way we talk about coal, which is <clears throat> an industry that is a public health threat, pollutes the air, pollutes the water. I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit in this room a little bit with that, but what, what I want everyone to take away from this is that we as students have access to the endowment, which is about two and two and two quarters, uh, two and a half billion dollars now, where we can leverage some power to try to make a difference in the world. And uh, that's kind of a continuation of things that have been done at UNC in the past. And we're really, really proud to continue that tradition here at UNC. And we feel like climate change, coal, fossil fuels in general are kind of the next logical step in that direction. Um, I encourage anyone who is interested in, in getting involved with Beyond Coal to come talk to us after the meeting. We definitely have spots for everyone, and we look forward to working with all the organizations here today. Thank you. Well, um, I should have introduced myself. Uh, my name is Tate Chandler. I'm going to be your MC slash uh, moderator for tonight for the panel discussion we're having. Um, we're going to have each speaker talk for about 5, 10, 15 minutes, how, however they feel like they need to discuss what, what they're going to discuss. Um, and then we, we're going to open up the, the floor to audience Q&A. We really encourage to, uh, you to ask deep, probing questions. Um, make our panelists sweat. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, we really want you to take away from this that um, whatever campaign you're fighting for um, or against, that there's always money involved on one side or the other. And the movement of money to your side it's always going to be beneficial. And the, the movement of money away from the people you're trying to fight against or fight for um, can be also really powerful. So I think that's one thing we're trying to, we're trying to hammer home here. Um, without further ado, I would like to first um, do a little short biography of our first speaker, Rudy Colorado. Um, he was, he's the associate press professor and associate chair of the Department of Anthropology at UNC. He is a PhD. Um, from UCLA in 1996. He is a cultural anthropologist concerned with community economies and, cu and cultural change in the context of globalization. During the 1980s, he served as the Canvas Y co-president, and him and his wife were involved in the push by universities across America to divest from companies in South Africa. His wife and three, uh, they helped set up the South Africa Fund as well to fund scholarships, and he'll talk more about that. Um, I'd like to introduce Bree Colorado. So that all sounded really cool, and then I have to tell you the truth. Um, so th that is my background. I was in your position 25 years ago uh, as a student here and going to events like this. Um, the, and so I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about what it felt like to be at Carolina in the mid-1980s, about the level of activism where the campaign against uh, South Africa fit into that, and then where divestment fit into that campaign, or that campaign against 
apartheid, I should say, uh, and how it was complicated. It was complicated. That's where I have to sort of come, you know, sort of <coughs> fill in details of what, what Tate said. So, uh, in the 1980s on this campus, it did not, there was not a whole lot of activism. It didn't feel that way when, when you were a student here. This organization, we don't, we didn't sell ourselves as this engine of social justice. We felt a, to be a service organization. And the big push of most folks was to figure out uh, interesting, creative ways to promote the, the, the different committees that were at work in the, in the communities. The social justice issue that was taken on was racism, and uh, where it was uh, hardest to address in fraternities and sororities, uh, the lack of connection across groups on campus. There was a focus on racism, but um, that was really kind of the vision within uh, and on this campus for the most part. How it's playing out. Uh, one, there were protests on campus related to the uh, Reagan administration and its policies in Central America. You had, a, you know, small and very committed group of people concerned about Nicaragua, about El Salvador, and about where uh, U.S. covert support was going in those wars. So. There was a presence in a sense that people on this campus cared about those issues. There weren't a whole lot of people involved. The South African issues and apartheid, apartheid was national news, and what turned the corner, making it become campus news, was the divestment campaign. It was a, a national movement. It was a national campaign. And why it gained so much traction here, I think, had a lot to do with one guy. I think Dale McKinley, who was a young man from Zimbabwe, who was a graduate student in, I think, political science was his, his home program, uh, was passionate about it. And so, that it, under his leadership, a, a group of students just really were able to sustain their, their commitment and involvement to the issue of divestment. So the idea of divestment came from somewhere else. The ability to push it on this campus was due to the kind of leadership that was happening here. The, the, the campaign itself was a mixture of what was confusing and obscure to people, divestment and investment policies, and, 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 what, and endowment. Students did not think about that. I don't think if you had those words on a flyer, you would get three people in a room back then. <laughs> The fact that you're all here is really impressive to me. So that part was was obscure, I think, to the students. One of the, the, the places where a lot of attention um, was, was achieved by the whole effort was the shanty town. Have you all talked about that? You know about that shanty town? So Dale organized this shanty town. They set it up out here. And the best thing that happened at shanty town is the college Republicans were and they attacked it. Well, this was a bunch of news, and, and so you had the students out there it's being attacked. Um, and it gave it gave a public face to the movement. Um, what also helped pull the whole thing together was, was having national speakers come through. Randall Robinson. I remember when he came to campus, he was he complained of, of a cold night out in front of the Shell Oil Company's lobbyists in front of. Uh, in, in, down in, in D.C. and he came down to this campus to talk and, and a lot of people came out for it. In fact, he had just been protesting somewhere else and he was going to come down here and be part of this protest again. We felt like we were connected to this. Um, so it was, there were a variety of things going on. And Dale used to take, you know, um, people like Richard Hoyle and Cheska Marco um, off to the, so the Internationalist Bookstore, which was here at that time, and they would get their anti-apartheid stickers, and, and you know, so there, there are things that you know you, you kind of connected off off the campus as well. Um, so divestment gave people a way to connect nationally, gave people a way to act here. It was uh, something that was that that got onto the trustees' agenda because of the protest in the shanty town. I think that helped a lot. In it was something that was more intuitive than just the actual policy of, of investing stuff. Um, it 
made real for more and more people the, the linkages that made South Africa part of our lives. It wasn't just somewhere else. The fact that, that you could talk about this meant that, uh, that we then should do something with that. So that part of it made it real. All that said, it was not um, something everyone agreed on. And one of the things that, so there was pressure, there were students, there were people for divestment, there were other people concerned about apartheid and did not think divestment was necessarily the right thing to do. And that's actually where Cheska comes into this story. And Cheska, uh, who is now my wife, who is now my girlfriend, and who was in South Africa. And she was in South Africa working for the South African Institute of Race Relations. And, you know, they were in the heart of it. She, in fact, lost her passport and plane ticket because the guy she was working for was told that he had 24 hours to leave the country because the security apparatus was coming to get him. So he took off, and in his car was Jessica's bag with her passport and her money and her plane ticket. And so she was in, you know, the heart of what was happening in South Africa. When she left, she said, what should we be doing? And the answer they got is, you need to help us get people to universities. And so that was the start of what is now still ongoing, a program at the campus wide, South African Scholarship Fund. I think, I don't know if it was renamed, I'm not sure its status. But at any rate, so that was where the idea came from. Then, the, the, and this is really why it's a shame on you guys is here, because he actually knows his history better than I. Again, I'm speaking as a student, as, as somebody who was here as the why. And, so again, all this was going on, it made it seem like we were connected to things, but uh, people didn't necessarily understand it, people didn't necessarily all agree that, that severing ties was the way to really engage apartheid, uh, that the South African Scholarship Fund is actually an alternative, and people were angry at that fund because they felt it was taking away from the divestment uh, effort. It gave the uh, investment maybe a moral cover to put money into the fund and not to fully divest. And again, this is where I've been to hear how things look from Bob Eubanks' point of view. That fund found a home here at the Campus Y, I mean, the, the, the scholarship effort found a home here at the Campus Y. We, we supported it and gave it an institutional base uh, as a way to become involved in it. Um, and I think that um, it, that's the way it felt was that we, we were engaging. The whole divestment project made um, South, put South Africa on the agenda, and apartheid on the agenda, and, and it made people realize that this university um, is really materially connected in a lot of ways we never even think about. It. That consciousness for many of us started with that campaign, um, and it is now I think a more part of your lives than it ever was. And it was controversial with what we should do. It was not obvious to everyone which way to go. And it was a, a sort of an ongoing debate. And, and that it's still, the legacy of that debate still exists um, here on this campus. Thank you, Marie. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to again thank the panelists for coming out. I know it's. Um, Ellie, you had quite a drive. We, we were talking about this, like Robert said, since December. Um, and it's, it's, really, it's really nice to see you here and see this together. Um, and just to um, put it out there again, like we, we, uh, one of the things we wanted, we wanted with this divestment teaching was to start this dialogue. And I, I want you and the audience to see this as a conversation. They, they, um, the panelists have some amazing knowledge about things that I, I don't know about. Um, and I think it's, it's really interesting how we can relate the things that they're talking about, like what Rudy is talking about, to what's happening right now, and how the, the consciousness you're talking about started then and is continued now. I think that's really important. Um, and I just want to, I guess, Mr. Eubanks is not here yet, so when he comes, we'll let him speak if he comes. Um, I'll just move right on to the next speaker, uh, Senator Ellie Kennard. Um, she is in her eighth term in the North Carolina Senate representing the people of Orange and Person Counties. She's been active in politics since 1987 when she was elected mayor of Carborough. She served for four terms as a popular leader for the environment, arts, and downtown uh, vitalization and neighborhood restoration. 
Ellie went to the Senate as an advocate for the environment, education, social justice, and campaign finance reform. In 2009, she was awarded the Senator of the Year by the Concession Council, our Conservation Council of North Carolina. She helped push House Bill 2010 that would require the state to divest its investments in Massey Energy, the coal company. Um, without further ado, Senator Ellie Tyler. passionate about what you feel your activism can accomplish. And so I'm going to talk about two things uh, on my part, but I'm going to start with the admiration that I have for student leadership, following up on what uh, Professor Colorado talked about. But if you look back just in my lifetime, and of course there are probably many generations before where students have been active, but I, I was very aware during the civil rights movement of the work that the, active, that the student activists did. If you look even here in North Carolina, you look at Greensboro, where the sit-down started, and if you look actually at Birmingham, there were students leaving that, students from colleges all over the United States. Of course it was Martin Luther King Jr., and of course it was Rosa Parks, but the, the boots on the ground were students, and they were putting themselves into situations where they were uh, beaten very often, uh, where they were arrested, but they were out there in the forefront of every one of the civil rights movements in, uh, uh, throughout the South. Um, here on campus, um, Tate alluded to some of those, the housekeeper strikes and the cafeteria strikes. Lenore, cafeteria strike was a big strike. How did they solve it? They closed Lenore down. <laughs> did they help them? The cafeteria workers, no, but the students were there saying, this is not right, we have to pay a living wage to these people who are there serving us day in and day out. Uh, the speaker ban, of course, was uh, massive. Uh, if you don't know what the speaker ban was, the legislature, in its wisdom, had, this is back in the Cold War, things were scary, uh, they thought, uh, that, that no communist could speak on campus. Uh, and of course there's 16, well there weren't 16, but that meant any campus. Well, UNC Chapel Hill was not going to take this line down. So they invited uh, Herbert Apthecker, who was a leading communist at the time, to speak. And of course he couldn't speak on campus. So he spoke at the wall in front of um, um, Silent Sam, that wall that runs between Franklin Street. He was on the sidewalk at Franklin Street. And the students were masked, and faculty, lots of faculty. Uh, were masked behind that, and then uh, my late husband actually, uh, they took this to the Supreme Court of, of North Carolina and they won. And they said it's unconstitutional, there is a First Amendment right to speak and to assemble peaceably. Uh, so that was a big one that the students led. And then the Vietnam War, that was huge. Students everywhere were leading that, and of course as you know, and, well you may not know, at Kent State four students were killed actually by uh, National Guard members, a terrible tragedy. Uh, but students were there. In this campus, you would see masses of people throughout this campus. Uh, and and there, we had, I stood for four years in a line in front of the Franklin Street Post Office where every Wednesday we had a silent protest there. And at one point, it went all the way down the walk to Columbia Street and then all the way up the other side. Well, after Nixon got elected, he said, I'm gonna end this war. So uh, a whole lot of folks went away, but a whole lot of us stayed there. And they would come up to us on these Wednesday vigils and say, why are you still here? Nixon said he's gonna end the war. Did he? Of course not. So we stayed there until it was over. But the students were absolutely crucial in that. Uh, the next thing is, um, the South African divestment, and I was glad to hear the history of that. Um, and then what happened was um, the, the, the sweatshop for, uh, that manufactured American products became very prominent here on campus. And uh, some years ago, Pete Andrews, who's in, I'm not sure what department he's in, um, had a class that was actually multidisciplinary, and there were 
a number of um, faculty who gathered together to teach this class. And they took Nike and followed it through to find out what the conditions were and all of the things, and that was a semester long class. And at the last day of the class, Phil Knight, who was the manufacturer and, of, and the owner of Nike, showed up. He was so impressed at what the students were doing. And shortly thereafter, he said, I'm going to change the way we operate our factories. And again, that was students who did that. <clears throat> then on this campus and many other campuses, all of the logos that are uh, official logos of the campus and Duke and many other campuses began to demand, the students began to demand that the manufacturing of those uh, official logos, whether it's caps or, or uh, t-shirts or whatever, had to be manufactured in factories that had safety standards, that paid a living wage, and uh, that were, had an environmentally sensitive footprint in all that they did. So that was what the students have done, and I commend you for what you're doing on this coal and other things. It's very, very important in changing public policy. And, it, and it's, it's like changing a battleship, as you said. It wasn't easy. Not everybody agrees. And in any of these, there was a lot of pushback. Then I am going to talk about, I'm going to switch now to what the, what the state government has done and is doing. And um, tell you, I've forgotten about the Sudan. I looked it up, and sure enough, there I was. In there. And uh, what this did was this was actually um, passed into law. Uh, but it was an act providing for how the state treasurer, and our state treasurer handles all of our retirement funds, um, now health care, but all of these, and that's a huge amount of money. Some of the largest amounts of money are retirement funds for the various states, so that was something that they could really have a, a profound effect on. And so this is an act providing for how the state treasurer shall address certain state investments relating to Sudan. And they have, the beginning of it talks about all the whereases of the findings of what's going on in Sudan and, and how these companies are invested in Sudan. Um, I think Sudan was easier than South Africa because South Africa was a highly industrialized, quite predominantly um, politically uh, governed uh, Place, and I think that there was a lot easier and harder because General Motors and all those big companies were down in South Africa. Sudan has been a failed state for so long that I don't think it was, it was much pushback. I don't think there, that it was nearly as difficult. So we have all the, the, that, that we have found genocide has been um, declared and they talked about the number of people who've been killed and they, at, at that term, Time was not ethnic cleansing, and that term hadn't been, but essentially that was, was it. <coughs> so what, what they did was they defined businesses and business practices, and then they began saying, this is the way we are going to address this. So they would look at any company and say, a company is complicit if they're taking actions which have directly supported or promoted the genocidal campaign in Darfur. And then they would talk about what direct holdings of a company is. And then they would talk about even an inactive business operation. Those companies were not let off the hook. Indirect holdings, they were, they were also subject to this. Anybody who was flying military equipment, and if you don't know, the United States is the largest manufacturer of military weapons and the largest exporter. We have bloody hands, I can tell you that right now. Then anything to do with mineral extraction, anything to do with oil-related activities, anything to do with any power production activities. So what they did was they said any of these funds could no longer be in any way connected to anything in Sudan. The teachers and state employees retirement system, the judicial retirement, the firemen's and rescue workers, all of these types of things, and that's a significant amount of money. And then they go on to talk about what they're going to do. They're going to scrutinize each of these
companies to find out if they have investment. And if the company is complicit by investment in this Starfor genocide or supplies military equipment, then they are going to be scrutinized and they will be contacted to say, you've got to cease and desist. And when that has happened, then eventually, of course, what it does is it brings down the, uh, the, any economic activity in Sudan, which was already, as I say, a failing state, but that was successful, we did pass that. Um, so now, I'm gonna to move to a couple of other things that the legislature has done. Um, I don't know if you remember the Upper Big Bend uh, uh, Branch, Upper Big Branch Coal Disaster where 29 miners were killed. And this is owned by Massey Coal Company, and they have a terrible record, an unbelievably bad, bad record. And so what uh, we did, uh, we introduced a bill which would have divested, unfortunately, we didn't, that one didn't pass. There was a lot of pushback on that. But the treasurer on her own did other things. She joined with the states, uh, looks like there are about 10, 12 states across the nation. And remember these retirement funds are the biggest single piece of investment that any company has. And that these are, are just incredible, influential, operators in this system. So what they began, the treasurers began doing, is writing to Massey and saying, and they said, we have 1.6 million shares with a market value of over 73 million. And they believe the recent tragedy reflects a serious failure of risk and oversight by the board of directors. And they spoke, spoke to all of these terrible accidents their, their record was terrible, their safety record. Uh, and so what we did was, we tried to get other, uh, other of these um, retirement funds to join together, which they did, and put pressure on Massey Coal to uh, hire their, their, their CEO and president. And then uh, they wanted to withhold their support from these various um, board of directors members who they said were not performing their duty for safety, environmental, and public policy commission committees. They were just ignoring all of these things. Um, the U.S. government pointed out they had 550 citations in 2009 alone and another 24 in 10. And these were, these constituted significant and substantial violations. And they said that these, uh, they have been 10 to 12 percent higher than the national average. So these coal company, this coal company, that finally ended up, as I say, with, with the death of these 29 workers, uh, was not responsive. No surprise there. But in talking with the, uh, the, the assistant to the treasurer, he said that, and this was over a period of time from April in 2010, May 2010, and the end of May 2010, they were putting pressure on that board and to fire the CEO, which they finally did, and to fire another director who was chair of the governance committee. And it was obvious their governance was not good. And um, it, of course, huge lawsuits and whatnot on that. So that's one way that the state has put leverage on a coal company. It's not the same as divestment, but nevertheless, we did um, put a bill in that would uh, have divest state investments in Massey Coal Company. What consequently happened was Massey was bought out by another coal company that's still operating, but um, I think it made a big difference because they are no longer, we assume, violating but what we did say in this bill was the state treasurer shall divest the state of any existing direct or indirect investment in Massey Energy Company and shall not invest any public funds in Massey Energy Company investments. Did not pass the legislature, but we tried. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that 
as much as anything, it, along with all the other things that are going on right now, really draws attention to this, and these companies begin to, to help respond somewhat. And then the other thing that we did, um, uh, we tried to go beyond that, and we put in a bunch of bills that didn't go anywhere, and as you know, it's happened to the legislature, or I hope you know, it's turned Republican. So whatever we hoped we could do is not gotten very far right now. So the other thing was mountaintop removal, and we said that uh, we, this is called the Appalachian Mountain Preservation Act, and this would prohibit electric public utilities that operate coal-fired generating units located in North Carolina from purchasing or using coal that is extracted using mountaintop removal coal mine. Very, very important because that is one of the things that is so destructive. The next thing that we did was, um, let's see. When did you introduce that one? That was 2009. No, please. Um, I mean, this is, a, this is a conservative state, and I remind people, and some of you are too young to even know the name, that we elected Jesse Helms five times. So, you know, it's a very, very uh, conservative state. So the next thing we did was an omnibus act regarding coal-based energy. And this was including the Appalachian Mountains mountaintop. But then we also have a problem with coal ash. And if you don't know about coal ash, um, one of the things that they do to prevent acid rain and the extreme acidity of coal plants is they mix it with, in their scrubbers, with lime uh, to make it less acidic. Well, then you end up with a huge, huge pile of lime. Very, very toxic. And it's got all of the metals from, you know, coal has a lot of heavy metals in it, mercury, 